we will get started. Welcome and thank you for joining the Society for Women's Health Research and the Organization for the Study of Sex Differences for a conversation on the elevation of sex and gender in publishing academic research. SWHR is a national thought leader in promoting research on biological sex differences in disease and improving health, women's health through science, policy, and education. And OSSD is a unique scientific organization that seeks to enhance knowledge of sex and gender differences by facilitating interdisciplinary communication and collaboration among scientists and clinicians of diverse backgrounds. I'm Irina Nigne, Chief Science Officer for the Society for Women's Health Research, and I know I can speak for both of our organizations and say how excited we are to host the accomplished panelists we have for today's program. In 2016, the National Institutes of Health implemented its Policy on Sex as a Biological Variable, or SABV, which outlined NIH's expectation that SABV will be a factored into research designs, analyses, and reporting in vertebrae, animal, and human studies. That same year, an international gender policy committee that was commissioned by the European Association of Science Editors released a set of guidelines for reporting sex and gender equity in research, also known as a SAGER. While these policies marked important steps forward in promoting diversity and inclusion in clinical research, reporting on SABV is not comprehensively incorporated within the broader research enterprise, including in academic publishing. For this special web event, SWHR and OSSD have brought together representatives from academic journals for a conversation about what they are doing to elevate the importance of sex differences research and insight into how journals are approaching policies related to reporting on sex and gender in research studies. We will be live tweeting during the event and invite you to use the hashtags SABV and hashtag sex and gender on social media. Our moderator for today's event is Dr. Jill Becker, Dr. Becker is the Editor-in-Chief of Biology of Sex Differences. She's a research professor at the Michigan Neuroscience Institute, professor of psychology, and the chair of biopsychology at University of Michigan. Dr. Robert Downs Jr. is the deputy Ed editor of the Journal of Women's Health. He's a professor emeritus of internal medicine and endocrinology at Virginia Commonwealth University and serves as the deputy editor for Women's Health Reports and chair of the Virginia Commonwealth Health Research Board. Dr. Melissa Simon at the Journal of American Medical Association or JAMA is the vice chair of research for the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, a professor of clinical gynecology at Northwestern University. Dr. Simon is also the founder and director for both their Center for Health Equity Transformation and the Chicago Cancer Health Equity Collaborative. Dr. Samya Swaminathan is the chair of Springer Nature's Research and Solutions DEI program. She's also the head of collaborations for the company and previously served as the head of editorial policy and research integrity for Nature Portfolio. As you can see, we have a powerhouse panel joining us today. And after an opening presentation about the topic, Dr. Becker will moderate a panel discussion for which those of you tuning in live will have the opportunity to engage by submitting questions using the Q&A function in the webinar platform. But first, we would like to do a couple of quick poll questions to learn about, a bit about you in the audience. And our first one is we're putting it up today. We wanna know how familiar are you with Sager guidelines? Are you familiar with the Sager guidelines that I mentioned? And it's yes or no. You just take, we'll leave the poll open for a couple moments. Are you familiar with the Sager guidelines? We'll do it another 10 seconds. The prompt should be up on your screen. All right. Thank you. And the and so that I guess we can post that answer. What do we have? We have about two thirds, a little over two thirds are not familiar, and about thirty percent is familiar. Thank you. Our next question we'd like to ask is: Have you published research with sex and/or gender data analysis? And so it's yes, no, or 
not applicable if you don't publish research. We know we have a very diverse audience joining us today. Have you published research with sex and or gender data analysis? Yes, no, not applicable if you do not publish research. Just another couple moments. Thank you so much. This is a bit more split, about half of those on, um, on our call today that have answered um, have published and then um, about 25, 26% have not. And then those, um, there's another percentage who don't. So thank you so much. It's, um, I'm sure as we're gonna get into this, you will learn more about SAGER guidelines and about being able to publish um, and what it means to publish on sex and gender data analyses in academic research. And so with that, I will turn the mic over to Dr. Jill Becker. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you, Irene, and welcome to everyone who is joining us for this webinar. We are excited to have a wonderful panel of editors. I'm Editor-in-Chief of Biology of Sex Differences, so I deal with sex differences um, in all aspects of um, individual animal or human uh, health guidelines. And I think we have... Um, a broad audience, and that is terrific because everyone is interested in learning about how to uh, best represent uh, their information and how do you move a uh, publication of uh, sex results about differences between uh, males and females into the uh, journal uh, guidelines. I think we should invite our um, panelists to join me because we have some uh, obviously members of the audience who are not familiar with SAGER guidelines, and we have some experts on the panel who have um, a, a great amount of experience with that. So um, could the panelists please turn their cameras on? Great. Um, so let's begin by talking about the SAGER guidelines and exactly um, what it is they are. They were launched in 2016, but it's actually a fairly long document. Um, and I wonder if um, Dr. Samananathan uh, would be willing to um, share information about the SAGER guidelines. Sorry for, for, for uh, mispronouncing your name. No, not at all. Um, thank you, Jill. So I'm happy to talk a little bit about the SAGER guidelines, which, as you noted, were launched in 2016. So really around the same time, I think that sex is a biological variable, the policy uh, and very influential, I think, policy position that the NIH put forward. Um, and really what SAGER does is create a very structured way to think about how one can uh, design an understanding of sex and gender differences into research studies really by default, really as you're thinking about developing your research study, bring that into, into the uh, design process. And then all the way, think about how you look at your results, how you interpret, how you analyze your data through that framework, and then finally, how you transparently report what you're learning, uh, again, you know, in a, in a disaggregated way, uh, using that same uh, uh, framework of sex and gender. Um, so it's a very comprehensive framework. And ideally, I think that although it was designed with journals in mind, ideally, it really needs to be taken all the way from conception of the research study through to, you know, the collection and interpretation analysis of data and then the final communication and dissemination through journals. Great, thank you. And what do you think are the biggest um, barriers to implementing these guidelines when it comes to your role as journal editors? Well, so I think that the, the guidelines themselves are fantastic. They're comprehensive. And I think the, the alignment across, um, you know, a, a set of standards is, is a very, very helpful starting point. 
And in, I think a number of journals have adopted these guidelines, but have done so in a pretty passive way. So, you know, basically by pointing to the guidelines in, you know, their editorial policy, which is basically what we were doing as well. Um, and I think that's a really good first start. But I think um, given all the demands put on authors from journals, from funders and many different stakeholders, I think one has to really find a way to focus on a few key elements uh, because the guidelines themselves are really comprehensive and detailed. And then also very importantly, really integrate it into the workflow that researchers and authors and reviewers and editors are subject to. And without that, I think it's very difficult to make, to make progress. And effectively, that's really what we've done uh, in the most recent update that we introduced um, within the Nature uh, portfolio of journals. Uh, Dr. Downs, would you like to comment? Well, I'll just say I, I agree completely. Um, the guidelines really are an essential part of the design of studies, not just the reporting of studies. And uh, journal editors, by emphasizing the importance of these guidelines, can tweak authors to um, address them more fully earlier in the process of design and reporting of the study. Um, I think perhaps we fall down by not always saying, go look at the guidelines from Sager. Um, we focus in on a particular issue that needs to be corrected rather than, um, rather than referencing the guidelines fully. And I think in terms of uh, the editorship that we do, um, taking into account the diversity of the study populations in so many different ways is absolutely crucial. Um, I think authors sometimes worry about uh, the power, the statistical power uh, problems that may result from uh, trying to analyze too many different things, but, but authors should take that into account when they're designing the study so that we can get good data that's applicable to everyone. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Simon, do you have a comment? I have nothing else to add. I think everyone answered that fairly completely. Great. So we have a question from the audience um, that I, I'm going to pose at this point. This is not related to Sager specifically. It, but um, so often women's health is interpreted as limited to reproductive issues or issues around a uterus. In my experience, this is too limited a view on women's health. Can the journals help to better define women's health with their readers or the public? Yeah. I, I will bite this off because okay. this is what our journal, Journal of Women's Health, really is for. We want to be a journal for the physicians who are the primary caregivers of women in all dimensions of their health. There are excellent journals that will take care of reproductive issues and um, focus on those. We would love to have more submissions and be able to accept more papers on cardiovascular issues, on neurologic issues, on the full spectrum of health issues that apply to women. And we're interested not just in research on women for those things, but on the gender differences that may exist between women and men. And so um, I'll just put a call to the many people who are on the webinar here. Um, I think all of the journals, the Springer journals, uh, the JAMA journals and the Journal of Women's Health would all love to be able to see a broader definition of what women's health is uh, and uh, have literature available on the full spectrum of health that involves women. I think 
I'll leave that and see what the other panelists have to say about that. I'll, I'll just add as the editor of Biology of Sex Differences, we see, um, I'm getting, for example, um, a, a large number of reports on sex differences in cancer uh, lately. Um, that's one of the topics that's exploding so much to the extent that I've added an associate editor who's that specialty. So throughout the biological spectrum, uh, sex differences are um, quite robust in, and it, that women's health should not be limited to the reproductive function sense for sure. I will add one other thing. And that is the journal editors do not do the research and write the papers themselves. So unless people submit these papers, we can't publish them. So we... Other comments? I also think it's important to continue to emphasize that there's sex as a biological variable and gender as the social construct or the phenotype and then how the intersection of that happens or occurs. And, and how then that uh, is combined to create this so-called women's health. So I think that's an important um, distinction to consider. And, and that relates to two questions that have just come into the, um, the chat about, uh, do the guidelines cover the difference between sex and gender or stipulate the requirements? And how does the concept of gender, how can, how is that defined? Um, how do, as a, as an editor, how do you manage the difference between sex and gender? And um, how do we disentangle the two terms? I'll, I'll note that there are now comprehensive form surveys that you can use to, um, pull out different aspects of gender when you're using a human uh, population that uh, Londa Scheinbeck has uh, published at Stanford, but there are other ways to define it as well. So actually just sticking with the SEGA guidelines, the guidelines start by offering some definitions of sex and gender and going back to exactly what Melissa said, and I'm, I can read from the guidelines in fact, the guidelines refer to sex as a set of biological attributes in humans and animals that are associated with physical and physiological features, including chromosomes, gene expression, hormone function, and reproductive and sexual anatomy. And then it also offers a, a description of gender, uh, which is referred to the socially constructed roles, behaviors, and identities of female, male, and gender diverse people. Um, and gender as an attribute that influences how people perceive themselves and each other and how they behave and interact and the distribution of power and resources in society. So, and I think actually Irene's opening slide pulled out some mm -hmm. of these attributes. Um, so, so the guidelines are very useful in sort of starting out with, with those uh, definitions. Uh, and then talking about the ways in which sex and gender interact and influence health um, in a number of ways. Other comments? So I have another question from the audience, which is along the same lines, which is since the guidelines are about both sex and gender, how do the guidelines include transgender individuals? For example, trans women who are assigned male at birth but are taking estrogen versus trans men who are assigned female at birth but are taking testosterone. How do you deal with this independent of the guidelines um, as journal editors? I, I would say that the, what the guidelines are striving for is for authors to be transparent with their readers about what they have actually done. So if they have completely ignored gender as they've analyzed their data, that's not so good. Um, but 
sometimes they have done that and they are neglecting to report on the data that they have. And Sager is basically just asking people to tell us exactly what you've done. Um, if you have done an analysis that's based on gender and you know you can say that um, you have allowed people to disclose their identified gender um, on a scale and include the transgender population as one of the populations that you studied in your research. It's just a matter of transparency. You don't have to get into you know, a lot of complicated issues. I mean, certainly there are, I'll leave it to the other panelists, but there are issues about for a transgender population, what's the relative contribution of the assigned sex at birth versus the social constructs that are overlay that. Um, but I think what we're asking with the guidelines is for people to just be transparent about what they're doing in the title of the paper, in the abstract, in the introduction, the methods, the discussion, and the conclusions to just be completely transparent. And the guidelines are not that complicated, really, I, I don't think. Um, I would just say, I'm, I'm, I was interested in the survey that said that 69% were really not familiar with this, because I think that one thing that we as journal editors and our reviewers um, deal with is encouraging authors to be more specific and more transparent about the distinction between sex and gender and about the analysis of um, sex differences and gender differences in the data that they have submitted. So how can journals do this? What are the, the ways, the approaches that journals can use to ensure that the manuscripts received are being submitted with consideration of um, sex and gender according to the guidelines? Um, I think the journals can do a lot, but they can't do everything and they certainly can't do it alone. So um, the approach we've taken is to raise awareness first of SAGER, you know, the comprehensive mm -hmm. guidelines through our policy pages. Um, but then secondly, we've also chosen now to focus on uh, a, a smaller subset of uh, the, the, the the aspects of the SAGER guidelines and integrate it into our author, work, author workflows and editor workflows and reviewer workflows. So that by focusing on a small set um, rather than you know, the, full, the full complete guidelines, we have a greater chance of perhaps nudging authors and reviewers toward greater transparency. So the focus is on awareness and transparency in the first instance, rather than taking a very strongly compliance oriented approach. Um, and I think, I think it's very, very challenging for journals to take a strictly compliance oriented approach if the stakeholders that are upstream in the process, um, especially institutions and funders are not, you know, if there isn't alignment uh, all along the research cycle. So, so I, I guess what I would say is our approach is awareness, transparency, and really bringing these uh, aspects to the fore and making them part of the discussion during the peer review process. And then understanding what is the gap between what we are putting forward as our uh, um, what should be ideal policy requirements versus the way the research has actually been conducted and analyzed and interpreted and so on. So you, do you include these things in the instructions to the authors, for example? Yes, yes. So they are part of the instructions to the authors, but they're also part of a checklist that goes out with every author and that every reviewer receives and that's ultimately published as part of the um, published paper. And that's that's what I mean about really integrating it into the workflow uh, 
into the peer review process. Right. And, and as an editor myself, I say to the authors out there, please read the instructions to authors, because sometimes that doesn't happen. And that helps to make sure that the journal auth articles are in compliance. Um, so we've touched on a number of the, the points already, but um, what are other ways that journals could be helping authors to incorporate sex and gender analysis in appropriate ways pre-publication so that we get the publications we want. We can give them guidelines, but are there um, other ways that uh, journals can reach out to potential authors and uh, help them find the right resources in order to do um, these analyses? Are there other approaches that your journals have used at all? Okay. Um, okay, so we have another question from the audience. Do the guidelines offer recommendations on how to survey or collect demographical sex and gender data to be inclusive or help assist subsequent data collection and analysis? Um, you are muted, Doctor. Um, uh, the guidelines are not telling us exactly how to how to do the research. Um, they are asking us to be transparent about how we did the research, and so I think um, sometimes, particularly in early phase studies or pilot studies, it's um, difficult to have sufficient number of observations to have statistical power to do an analysis on a, a lot of different attributes of the population. Um, I, people should not be discouraged by that. If, if it's a pilot study, you can still uh, do an analysis um, that's underpowered as a hypothesis generating exercise. that will help people um, in the next phase of research, when it gets to a larger study, move on to um, be able to have sufficient power to analyze these things. But I think uh, sometimes authors are intimidated by the fact that we are asking them to um, answer these questions for so many different attributes of the population. And they worry about the statistical power of small groups. And I, I think that um, I would just say, we, we obviously don't want a paper that's not adequately powered for any outcome, but uh, if it's an early phase study that's generating pilot data and you can do an analysis that helps other researchers in the design of their studies, you should make sure that you have disclosed that data. The SAGER guidelines are there to help you do it. Be interested to see what the other people have to say. So it's more than SAGER guidelines, and we're kind of hung up on this, and I want to get us away from this because it's more than that. It's about how you state who you included, how you identified those people or persons or individuals or groups that you included, and what are their identities, what are their ranges of their identities, and why did you get that information? Um, of their identities. What are you going to do with it? Meaning what, what did you um, leverage from that knowledge of the different identities that could include self-reported race, ethnicity, age, um, zip code, uh, other things, including uh, you know self-reported sex and gender um, as well. And, and what are you gonna do with that in the analysis plan? And why did you do that? Right, so it's all of those things. So it's more than just stage or guidelines. Agreed, and, and so let's move away from the SAGER guidelines and talk about the responsible conduct of research training. How can we incorporate um, analysis of sex and or gender um, into how we um, are training our um, 
future scientists and current scientists uh, about reporting sex as a biological variable. Do you have thoughts on that? Um, I have a view on it. I don't, uh, I mean, I think it's, um, from my understanding, it is a big gap. It, it isn't currently part of responsible conduct of research. And to my mind, that is actually the ideal um, setting in which a number of the questions that have been raised and that Melissa also alluded to is how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you address sex and gender? How do you go about collecting data in a responsible, ethical, and inclusive way that also goes beyond gender to include other types of identities? What does it all mean for your research study and for your, you know, for the interpretation and you know, translatability of your research study? So I feel there's a big gap there and a big opportunity. Um, and I think that, you know, when you look at the overall structure of how we train our scientists and clinicians, that to me seems to be, would be the place where we should embed training. And so what types of things would make that training something that people would embrace? I, I mean, I've studied sex differences in the brain for over 30 years. And yet at the University of Michigan, where I'm at, I will say that the neuroscience graduate program gets one lecture from me about sex differences um, that's required for the graduate students. And if um, the biopsychology graduate program gets more because they're stuck with me frequently for a whole semester. But um, you know, but that's it. That's you know, one piece of a course or one semester uh, is not enough to make uh, graduate students know everything about sex as biological right. variable. And we don't require training in sex as biological variable for our medical students. Um, how, do, how do we make these changes uh, so that our future scientists and doctors are trained in this Any thoughts? I will say a couple of things. So at the publication side, we're on the back end of the design, yeah, exactly. recruitment and analysis of these studies. Um, the institutions and the granting agencies that are funding research are closer to the front end. And particularly, I think that the fact that NIH has made sex as a biological variable an important aspect of their funding um, requirements for applications, raises the bar and increases awareness. On the publication side, I think that our journals have done an excellent job of showing the historical exclusion of women and other groups from clinical trials over the years. Um, there's, and you can just go recently, we've published data on the uh, persistent underrepresentation of women in cardiovascular clinical trials for both medications and for devices where it's important to have that data. And so the fact that people are doing those kinds of research that ends up in a journal that's published and, and then read hopefully has some impact on people who are working on recruitment of participants for these clinical trials so that they can do a better job of recruiting a diverse population of participants for clinical trials, analyzing data and publishing it appropriately. Yeah, and I think it needs to be weaved into everything, right? So when you're talking about like a journal club in a training program, whether it's a medical school, nursing school, a public health graduate school, um, you want people to understand who participated in that research um, trial and why. 
And how were the, again, like I said earlier, how are those identities self-reported and collected and what did they use them for in the analysis? And then how generalizable are those data to the rest of the population? And then take it a step further when we teach our um, trainees and students around uh, social and economic determinants of health, you know, factors that influence health outcomes. And we talk about disparities here and there and everywhere. Um, well, what do we really know about the research, right? What do we know about if, if we're talking about a therapeutic or treatment options for a particular condition, take cancer, for example, many of the leading cancer um, treatments for common cancers, especially in the United States, but around the world, the data are from a very homogenous group of clinical trial participants. And when you look at who um, bears the burden of, of inequities in certain cancers, say breast cancer or endometrial uterine cancer, um, you know, again, the populations that participate in the clinical trials are not necessarily the people who bear the brunt of the disparities. So black women in uterine cancer have uh, traditionally not been included in endometrial uh, cancer treatment clinical trials. And so the data are only go as good for the treatments as who participated and how um, that protocol and study was designed. So I think when you're an editor of a, a journal trying to <laughs> rectify this, it's really important to get the message out earlier on in the pipeline about how the research studies are designed and who gets to participate and how is that reach out done? Because it's critical. So then being able to weave that into training is critical along every single pathway of training, um, including um, when you're talking about uh, human subjects research and, and all of those um, required um, uh, uh, classes or courses that are required when you start your graduate school training. Yeah, I teach undergrads and undergraduates, when you tell them that most of the drugs that they're being prescribed are tested primarily on young men um, and that young women aren't being included in the you know, clinical trials of, you know, for the, the FDA approves, they're just shocked um, that that's the case. So I'm, I'm hopeful that the next generation will um, not be indoctrinated into the um, the current views that a, a, a small, you know, young, a small population of young men is sufficient to test how drugs work. Um, any thoughts? So what, there's a question about including this topic in undergraduate education early to help set the stage for stronger experimental design that scientists will incorporate as default into the design of their research studies. Are there any thoughts for educators about how you might do this? I mean, I think it's a lot of what I just said. It's yeah. it's about infusing it into different parts. If you teach a science course or a even a communications course, like if you're in if you're in a school of communication, I would argue that these types of questions and considerations are really critical when you're teaching people to interview folks about work, about science, and about health. Um, so I would encourage this type of approach in every. <laughs> possible aspect and area. Yeah, I just want to wholeheartedly second what Melissa has shared now and previously. I think it's got to be truly comprehensive. And um, I mean, you know, there are uh, stakeholders across the research and publishing ecosystem that have enormous power and ability to, to help change how we conduct research, who we're recruiting, how we think about um, disease therapeutics, you know, who, who is it all for? Funders, absolutely. You, you mentioned the FDA. The, I'm just looking at this. Actually, the FDA has put sex and gender specific analysis and reporting at the center of uh, a new strategic plan around medical devices, but also pharma, you know, uh, uh, who are at the heart of developing new drugs and clinical trials. Um, so I, I think it has to be truly comprehensive. 
I will add one other thing. I think that um, particularly those who are involved in uh, clinical trials need to be aware that sometimes the, we set up non-sex related criteria for inclusion in clinical trials that have the effect of generating a disparity on sex and gender. So for instance, in cardiovascular clinical trials, because men may have cardiovascular disease earlier than women, if you set up an age limit for the upper limit for um, eligibility for your clinical trial, you'll find it harder to recruit, to, to have a population that is adequately representative of women. Um, and, and so even when the FDA has told um, pharma and device manufacturers that they need to do post-marketing studies to prove, to flesh out the sex and gender differences that may exist for the effectiveness of their drug. Pharma still falls down on the job. Uh, it's, they need to be very intentional about how we recruit patients. And I would just say, I think that the, uh, the Springer Nature guidelines for authors are fabulous in, in this regard. It, it's just, um, you know, those are maybe not the first thing that the authors see when they go to the website. And if they go to our website, they don't see that what the Springer Nature has at, at all. So um, I would just say that the um, participants in the webinar, go take a look at the Springer Nature guidelines and author's instructions. So here's a question from the audience, and that is, are journals running into issues of peer reviewers being undertrained on sex and gender and who can consequently give incomplete or incorrect feedback on sex and gender um, in their reviews? Could journals provide training to individuals serving or um, as peer reviewer? as peer reviewers, which might improve the reviewer's ability to give quality feedback on this topic. It's a really good point. Our reviewers are our authors and our readers and, um, and our EICs and EBMs as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's an interesting suggestion to think about dedicated training um, the NIH, in fact, has just released some training that's uh, focused on sex and gender. Um, so it's also possible to point people to existing resources as well. But that's 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 a that's a great suggestion. And the C Canadian Institute on Health, uh, Sex and Gender, or Gender and Sex, um, has training materials as well that are excellent. So what about thinking more broadly about the human population and realizing that not all women are alike and not all men are alike and there's a diversity of gender identities and um, race and ethnicity that interact with the, um, how individuals are perceived and their health. Um, can you speak to the importance of intersectionality? To what extent is it something that you think about when you're considering the importance of findings that are being reported in your journals? It's a hard question. I, I, well, I mean, I think it's, for me, it's imperative, right? Intersectionality is critical because when we show up, we show up with all of our identities uh, or, you know, we show up the way we show up in the world, right? And people judge, right? Because everybody has bias of some sort. Um, and so having um, those identities and that inter and, and studying that intersection of those identities and how they influence outcomes, I think is really critical and where literature has not gone well before um, and needs to go really to push that more and more. Um, yeah, I'll let my co-panelists answer 
I mean, uh, I sorry, Robert, go ahead. Well, I was going to say I, I agree completely um, with what Dr. Simon just said that intersectionality is critical. Um, and just as we would like authors to be fully transparent about the gender aspects of the studies that they've done to pay attention to sex as a biological variable in all stages of research, um, considering all of these different attributes that patients have is important. Go ahead. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think it's just a matter of time, really, before one starts doing this in a more um, systematic way. Um, but I think that is where we're heading. And I will put in a, an additional little plug here. I think if we, one of the ways that would help really help to advance science is to be more inclusive of women and other diverse populations as we advance undergraduates to graduate students and postdocs and scientists, the professional development of a diverse population of scientists and academics is absolutely critical to making this issue, putting this issue on the front burner. We have, um, should we always include the word sex or sex and gender or in females and males if biological sex is being studied or men and women in the title of a paper? Or should we not have to point this out in the title? It should always, it should be considered in the course of all papers. Is there an opinion on this? It's actually something that we are now increasingly seeing our authors do as a result of the pilot and the updated guidelines um, is be much more transparent about, um, let's say the sex of the mice that were used um, in the abstract. Um, so we are starting to see that. And I think that methodological transparency is really important. Yeah, I think it's important to include the sex and species in the title so that it's easier to know what you're going to be seeing within an article. And authors should recognize that this helps their readers to find the articles that the readers are most interested in. If the information is yeah. right there in the title and the abstract, then a reader who's particularly interested in this will be able to find the paper more readily. So here, here's a comment, but sex, gender, intersectional analysis are a set of skills everyone needs to learn. Diversity in participants is crucial from a justice point of view, but everyone needs to learn the skills, of course. Thanks, Landa. So um, this is probably beyond our purview at this point. But um, one of the audience members asks, I'm curious what the panelists think on establishing platforms for a wider range of interdisciplinary topics in undergrad and grad courses, meaning not just sex and gender and biology, psychology, psychiatry, or clinical sense, but incorporating research from women and gender studies from a sociological perspective, bringing this up because sex and gender topics are um, more intertwined with social science than some other um, more strictly biological questions. Any thoughts about how to make intersectionality, interdisciplinarity um, a, a broader topic? Well, I'm here today on behalf of Susan Kornstein, who's the editor in chief of the Journal of Women's Health. And for 20 years, she's led the VCU Institute of Women's Health, which is a university-wide 
center that includes those other um, sociology, psychology, educators um, in a in a university wide emphasis. And I'm sure that the other people on the who are on the call as participants or the panelists understand the importance of that. Put, put groups together um, that go across disciplinary boundaries. Yeah, I think it's important. I would also encourage people to think about the Organization for the Study of Sex Differences, one of the co-sponsors of this. We have resources available um, through the OSSD website and um, materials that have been collected by Art Arnold um, to help educate people as well. So <laughs> we've been focusing on humans. What about mice and rats and other, excuse me, non-human animals? How do the Sager guide guidelines and approaches to publishing uh, other species apply? Uh, it's pretty clear cut, actually, I would say, and a lot more straightforward um, when applying Sega to, to animal research. Um, I think the, the focus on transparency and methodological transparency and being clear about sex aggregated differences apply across the board. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, it does apply to animal research, and I think the application is likely more straightforward in that case. Great, I, I would say the, the, the question of whether um, animals have gender is something that is actually hotly debated within the basic research uh, groups that I've been a part of, some argue that you, uh, rats can't have, or rats and mice can't have gender, and others arguing there are uh, gender associated traits that are characteristic of male and female non human animals as well. Um, so I want to bring Irene back on to help close out the, the session. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, we often have, as you can see, when we did our opening poll, um, very diverse audiences that span researchers and scientific leaders, um, as well as policy professionals that tune into our webinars like this. And so before we wrap up, I wanted to ask each of you to go around and what is one final takeaway that you would like to highlight to our viewers to help them better elevate sex and gender in publishing their academic research, whether it's supporting and they are the researcher or they're in a space where they can influence that. Um, and so I guess if we um, start with Robert, then Melissa, then Samia, and then we end with Jill. All right. Well, um, the big takeaway, I would just say that really what this is, is about paying attention to the diversity of the world um, and recognizing that the medical or sociologic problems that we're studying may have different outcomes for different people, depending on their characteristics. And we need to, as researchers, look for those different outcomes and be transparent in our reporting of them. Yeah, I would echo that and, and add that, you know, we bring all of our identities um, as we traverse our life and interact with different um, things to create outcomes and health or well-being, et cetera. And it's really important to understand that if you're a scientist or you're writing a manuscript for a uh, submission for publication, because then you want to make sure that the study that you are the met or the manuscript that you have created actually captures those identities well with respect to the outcomes that you are reporting. Um, 
I concur with everything that Robert and Melissa have just said. And I would say one more thing, regardless of where you are as a stakeholder in the system, um, the one action that you could take is to campaign for inclusion of sex and gender and an intersectional uh, analysis as part of the training that your institution or your funder uh, offers. So really integrate this into how we're training our trainees, I guess. Because that is what is really going to be needed to, to deliver sustainable change. I agree. Um, if, if I were to summarize, I, what this webinar has shown, I believe, is the interest and importance of understanding sex and gender broadly defined as we're um, investigating our research. And that in order to be able to do that best, we need to include all types of individuals and we need to train our young scientists at every level, the importance and how to um, incorporate these types of variables into our research and how we think about the studies that we're reading so that we can then also know whether the studies were done in a way that you can trust the results to be applicable to all of the individuals that are uh, representative of the, the species. Thank you all. I think that that word right there, applicable and thinking in who is it supposed to be for and who is it supposed to help? And so um, kind of honing in on if it's for a particular group, if it's for multiple groups, then the data should reflect all of those individuals and be analyzed according to that. And that's the best way to get that information out. Thank you so much. You've been an amazing panel <laughs> and we really appreciate um, your time and your insight. Thank you, Dr. Becker, for facilitating this very much needed conversation. Um, we invite those online. You can continue to connect with SWHR on our website, www.swhr.org, as well as on social media to register for future events, download women's health resources, and sign up for our newsletter. We also, um, you also can visit OSSD's website and social media to learn more about sex differences research, scientific meetings and events, and membership opportunities. Uh, we will be sending out an email with the recording of today's event to all registrants, as well as posting the recording of this event on the, the of this um, public forum on our events webpage for future viewing. So please be on the lookout for that and feel free to share with others. We will continue this conversation with hashtag SABV and hashtag sex and gender. Thank you for joining us.